Hey folks, Randy Newberg here, and you're listening to another episode of Loopholds Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, this one, again, is going to be in a little different format because we're recording it for our YouTube channel in addition to recording it for the podcast. And in this one, it's a little bit of a piggyback off the one we did. When did we do that one, Marcus? A week ago, two weeks ago? Yeah. About all the elk question and answer. And you weren't able to get through all the questions on that one. No. Nope. And then since then, with Botech, Leupold, and RMEF, we started a new thing called Elk Talk uh, Live Video. On Wednesday nights, it's half hour of just us doing Q&A. And right now, it's just on the Facebook channels of us, uh, Randy Newberg Hunter Facebook, uh, Leupold's Facebook page, uh, Botex Facebook page. And then there's the live stream feed on our Hunt Talk forum and stuff. So with that, it's been all Q&A about elk hunting. And so Matthew has went through a lot of those questions that we haven't got to. Right. And we've received hundreds of them. And that's, uh, that's kind of I should probably tie this together. The reason we're doing more of this is the number of questions we got on the Elk Talk Q&A live video. There's no way we're ever going to get through all those. Never. We, we'd be live for 20 hours to get to all those questions. So we're trying to get through some of them here on the podcast because I think, well, the podcast is just a good fireside chat sort of idea uh, or platform. And we can cover a lot of that ground and hopefully get to some of the questions we can't get to on the on the Facebook Live or the Elk Talk Live. So anyhow, all of you know that this podcast is brought to you because of the good folks at a few companies. Uh, Leupold, being the title sponsor of this, is also one of the partners that's uh, promoting the Elk Talk Live uh, Wednesday nights with us. Uh, I don't know what all I can say about Leupold that I haven't said before, other than it's a company that is committed to hunting, committed to conservation, committed to us, the self-guided public land group that we represent. And I just want to thank them for uh, all their great support. Uh, Onyx Maps, uh, we've done a ton of YouTube videos about how to use the Onyx map stuff. And when we're out hunting, it's... I, <laughs> I would feel so lost without my Onyx maps. Uh, like when we were doing that bear hunt the last couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. We, <laughs> <laughs> we're hunting right on a public-private boundary. And sometimes the bears were in the wrong place. And with the Onyx maps, it keeps you from, from getting in trouble. Uh, and with the, the web map system, that's the, the system on the uh, desktop, yep. you can do all this e-scouting, all this other stuff. And we're coming up with some some ideas we're working on with the Onyx Maps people. Can't let the cat out of the bag yet. I think it'll be ready in another month or two, but people will want that. Just trust me, you will want that. Uh, and if you use promo code Randy, we're making life easy for everybody. Use promo code Randy. Uh, and you're going to get uh, uh, a discount. Uh, a very nice discount on all your purchases of app products from Onyx Maps. Uh, Orion Coolers. Um, it's starting to get warm. Matthew, we were walleye fishing yesterday. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't. Know. <laughs> well, we caught one of everything, just not much in the way of walleye. Uh, and uh, we we brought our Orion Cooler with, but we didn't really need it. We mm -hmm. released everything we caught. Yeah. But anyhow, it, Orion Coolers are just the the best cooler out there if you want a roto motor molded cooler that's going to last forever orion coolers is it again promo code randy r-a-n-d-y and you're gonna get yourself this really cool tumbler uh to go along with it uh and then the last one i've saved these the, this this one for last because we got a little bit of a change going on with what the promo code represents for the go hunt insider but now all the drawings are over for the most part and it's over-the-counter options for elk. It's uh, leftover tags. It's general tags. Uh, three states that you're probably going to focus on are Colorado and Idaho. And if there's any leftovers in Montana. 
But the, the Go Hunt Insider has all this detail about all these general units, all these over the counter units. So it's even after the drawings are done, and they do such a great job explaining every state, how it works, the best drawing odds out there. Uh, go to uh, gohunt.com forward slash insider. And now, if you use the promo code Randy, what you're going to get, they have a new gear shop out there that has some of the best western backpack mountain type hunting products there it's a retail uh part of their website and you're instantly as quick as you sign up for the insider and use promo code randy you're going to instantly get 50 dollars worth of free store credit in their gear shop uh i it's like free money and uh the quality of the product that they have there is just excellent excellent product you'll see a lot of the products of companies that we use so gohunt.com forward slash insider promo code randy um, and now we're going to get to a whole bunch of questions uh, i don't know where we want to start who's who's got the biggest list or the longest list well i've got a good question based on what you were just talking about okay uh, how do you actually go about getting over the counter tags oh well, a lot of times it depends on our schedule of what fits our calendar. And this year, I'm, I'm lucky that I live in Montana. So as a resident, I can get an over-the-counter tag. But a lot of you aren't, so let's not cheat <laughs> and use my example. But many years, you'll see us hunt in Colorado. Uh, if we end up without a bunch of elk tags and we try to get anywhere from four to eight elk hunts a year on the TV show... Uh, we go to Colorado. Colorado has over-the-counter tags for archery for the second rifle season and the third rifle season. And I think it covers 90-some uh, units, which most of those are their units that are heavily weighted with public land. Uh, Idaho is the other place. And I, I get that guys are mad, or, or not mad, but Newberg, when are you coming to Idaho? It just never fits the calendar. It's, Idaho's general season is the last half of October. And it seems like we're always on the road uh, that period of time. So those are the two places to really get over-the-counter and general tax. They're always available to non-residents. Um, and then Montana, this is the year. I warned everybody, don't count that Montana is always going to have leftovers. <laughs> this was the year when Montana's elk tags and deer tags, most of them sold out. So there's some people who are turning them back in over the course of the summer and asking for their partial refund, and then those get reissued. But those would be the places where you're going to get those. Utah also has a, a general uh, season that you can sign up for, but it's, it's uh, a pretty crowded season. Uh, a lot of it is spikes only. A uh, little bit harder hunt, and I just... With the amount of crowds there, I, it, it never makes my list. Uh, Utah's got amazing elk hunting in its limited entry units, but I've not been lucky enough to, <laughs> to draw every year. I draw in two, drew in 2014, didn't get one. You've got 15 or 16 points there. We need to figure out when. When, when I can you, actually go on a hunt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you yeah. apply, Marcus? Do you apply in Utah? I don't, no. Don't no. Okay. <laughs> Well, that uh, that hopefully that answers their question about how we get uh, over the counter tags. So, so that's what's left currently, right? Isn't there some over the counter stuff in Wyoming, or if there, you have there, to do it earlier? Or? Yeah, there will be some leftover tags in Wyoming. Okay. Cow tags, gotcha. um, and if you're a cow hunter, oh man, across the West right now, yeah, Colorado just got done with their draw. There's oodles and oodles of cow tags left over in Colorado. Okay. There will be in Wyoming. Uh, a lot of the states have leftover cow tags, which, hey, there's nothing to be ashamed of about going cow hunting. They taste just as good. <laughs> or better. <laughs> or better, yeah. <laughs> They're usually easier to find. Uh, in, in rifle seasons, a lot of times they're not in the hell holes that bulls, old mature bulls are in. There's a, there, you know, as I'm getting old and decrepit, the idea of cow hunting gets more and more appealing every year. Yeah, and then you don't have to pack antlers out either. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Marcus, you're on to it. 
You don't have taxidermy <laughs> taking up the entire room? Yeah. No, this is this room. <laughs> you can see there's an, if you're watching on the YouTube, there's an elk right here, and it's not mine. It's the only elk we've ever mounted in this entire house, and it's Matthew's. Yeah. That was your first bull up in the Missouri River breaks, and that's not an over-the-counter elk tag. No. That's a rather hard to draw out tag. So, yeah. and then with the over-the-counter tags, how do you actually go about purchasing them? Do you just walk into the Fish and oh. Wildlife Department? Do you that's like call ahead? <laughs> Can you get it online? What? Yeah. What kind of paperwork do you need to bring with you? That's a good question. All of them you can buy online. Uh, in Colorado, you can go. The, the reason they call it over-the-counter, you can go to the hardware store, to Walmart, to whatever, and buy it when you show up but if you show up after the season has already opened you have to go to a division of wildlife or parks and wildlife office to actually buy it after se after the season has started uh idaho you can again you can buy online but they charge a pretty heavy transaction fee to buy online in idaho um you can mail it in to any of the fish and game offices in idaho montana you can i think it's pretty much you got to buy it online so with Al Gore's internet, I mean, he, we all, you have Amazon Prime, we should have like Fish and Game Prime or something like that, where tags are delivered overnight to your front door. There you go. Someone will probably come up with an app for that. But. <laughs> so wh who's next? What do, what do we got? Matthew, you got uh, another one? Yeah. Uh, what's your biggest bull? My biggest bull. Uh, and what is its score? Oh. So we're we're this is a hunting story, so I can stretch it a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, I won't do that. I, I don't know what it scores. Uh the biggest one I've shot was in central Montana, uh two thousand fifteen. It's out on our YouTube channel. Uh and I just lucked out. I didn't think it was that big of a bull. I just thought it was an average six point when it was standing there looking at me. And we'd been running and huffing and puffing and when I shot it, I, it took off running, ran up the hill, and I'm finishing it off. And when it falls over, I'm like, holy cow, that thing's got seven points on each side. <laughs> that's a lot bigger than I thought it was. So, But uh, that's uh, that's the biggest one I've ever shot. I've missed one bigger than that in Arizona <laughs> mm -hmm. when you and I were on that hunt. And yeah. You and the camera guy went one way, and I went the other way, and I had to try self-film it. But... Uh, so I don't know. I don't get too worked up about scores. I don't get me wrong. If there's two big ones standing there, <laughs> or, or a big one and a little one, I'm shooting the big one. I mean, pretty much everybody is that way, I think. Yeah, it's kind of a nice little token that you can keep. Yeah. And I, antler. There's something about antlers that are pretty cool. There, know. there is. I mean, and and I don't. I think all antlers are cool. Big, small, in between. I do have a, an episode, that, and it, again, it's out on our YouTube channel. All of our stuff's out on YouTube, but it was uh, a Wyoming elk hunt where there was a bull bedded and one standing, and the one standing was smaller, but he provided the best shot. And I'd been hunting for a long time. I'd been stuck. I'd lost my camp to a blizzard, uh, and I said, you know what? Bird in the hand here. I, I'm not going to wait for that bigger one to stand up. I'm taking a shot at this one and and he fell over and the big one stands up and looks at him like what happened pete <laughs> <laughs> but now i don't i i understand people getting worked up about it uh archery i've shot three bulls with my bow uh and one of them is just so cool one side he's got 28 inch thirds or tw a 28 inch third which it's pretty that's wild. <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's I to me any any elk's a trophy. Any elk with a with a bow is definitely a trophy. And to me, I just say whatever looks good when I'm looking at it, based on how hard I've worked, what the story's been, and everything else, that pretty much drives whether or not I'm shooting something. So, how about you, Marcus? You shot a really big bull here. In Montana. I did. With yeah. your bow, right? Yeah. But that being said, I've never passed up a bull elk. I just get, <laughs> I've, I've gotten really lucky a couple of times. I, I, yeah. I did 
did have that one scored because it, it made Pope and Young. So yeah. That was, I think you, it was just shy of 350. Wow. You've never passed one up. Not, I'm, I mean. I'm proud of you. Not really, no. Yeah, I, I have, I have to admit, I've passed a few up, but not because I'm quote unquote trophy hunting, just wanted to hunt longer or whatever. And uh, that's it just, at the time, it didn't strike me that I'd, I need to shoot that bull. Yeah. And, uh, but this year, Marcus and I have tags together in a unit in Wyoming. And he's already assured me that any raghorn is going down. Unless we just, you know, if there's bulls just scattered across the hillside, you know, maybe. Maybe yeah. I could pass up my first bull, but yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I trust myself. I'll probably <laughs> get pretty well, excited. Well, it's any elk, so I might shoot a cow. There you go. I, yeah. I was just about to ask. You've never shot a cow for the TV show, right? Uh-uh, never have. Maybe this would be a good time to do it. Yeah. And like you said, then you got to go and make another trip to get your antlers out. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll shoot a spike and I'll just saw them off and I'll put the antlers in my back pocket or something. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, what else? What, what's our next one? Uh, when do you call it a day due to too much other hunting pressure in a certain area that you've been hunting or glassing or anything like that? Never. <laughs> We never call it a day until it's too dark to hunt. Okay. Uh, uh, but I, I get what someone's saying is we might call it a day in that place because, wow, there's a lot of people here. I didn't expect this. Um, it happens. Uh, like you know, in that archery hunt last year with Corey in New Mexico, I didn't think we were going to run into that many people. And there were times we just kind of, all right, let's pull out of here. Let's go yeah, to a different spot. Move spots. But we never just fold it up for the day and say, oh, uh, I'm I'm not going to hunt today because there's too many people. And, and that kind of gets to the point of hunting pressure is when you hunt strictly public land like we do and you do a lot of general season and over-the-counter hunts, you get in those situations where there's a lot of people in the hills and – you got to figure out how to use that to your advantage. And if I'm a traveling non-resident hunter and I can time it right, I'm going to try to get there so I can hunt, start hunting on Monday. Mm -hmm. I'll have less pressure than on the weekend. The locals will be there mostly on the weekends. And then if, if I can do that, then by the time about Wednesday or Thursday rolls around, the elk are starting to get a little more comfortable because the pressure hasn't been as extreme. And it just seems like that's uh, that's helpful to to try a plan it that way if you can. Um, the other part is sometimes I prefer to hunt the last part of a season. If it's a three-week, four-week season, I'll go the last part of the season because I know that everyone's been out there the first week and they're just hammering it and trying their best to fill their tag. And by the end of the season, you almost have the place to yourself. Like when we were with Pat in Wyoming, yep. we did not – did we see another hunter? I think we saw some vehicles, but I don't remember ever seeing anybody get out of the vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> and the first day we ran into a herd of, I don't know, 300 elk? At least, yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. And they'd all been pushed away from the roads, and we walked in there, and there they were. Uh, my back and knee is kind of glad that we didn't shoot one <laughs> back there, but that was the first day of the hunt, so we were doing a little bit of window shopping there. But uh, So yeah. I... Well, I, the the question the person's question of do we call it a day no uh, yeah. my my elk hunting days are too precious uh, i'll get time to sit around camp or sit at home in january or february i'm not i'm not folding up the tent yeah when i have a tag in my pocket and what's kind of that threshold for pressure before you move to a different spot is it you run into two other hunters in the same area or and it, is it a safety thing, or just you're probably not going to see too many animals if there are too many other people in the area? Yeah, I'm not real worried about the safety thing. Maybe I should be, I guess, if a bullet came whiz <laughs> whizzing <laughs> by my head. It but. seems like it would depend on how big of area you're talking. Like if we're hunting yeah. small chunks of public land or something where there's only like 160 acres or whatever, like maybe that's where it becomes more of an issue versus, right. so, I mean, so much of Western hunting, you're like, you have miles that you can go, and so you can just keep moving and moving until you find somewhere where there's less pressure. But yeah. imagine, I mean, there is situations where you hunt 
smaller sections, right? Where that yeah. could become more of an issue where you'd have to pack it up and head yeah. out or something. Yeah, there is. In fact, one of the places I hunt in Colorado, uh, I didn't know this, but they punched open a, an oil and gas company, punched a road into this mesa. Well, I used to walk up the spine, a, a nose that came off that mesa, and I had the place to myself. Well, I didn't know that oil and gas company put a road up there, and so I walk up there one day that because I'd hunted it, I think two years, two times prior to that, and the sun comes up, and there are orange dots everywhere. I'm like, what in the heck? So I I can realize that none of these people walked in like I did. What's going on? So later on, I I did pull out that morning and said I got to go find another one of my other spots. And in driving by to go to another spot, here's this brand new big road. I'm like, that's never been there before. So I drive up to see where that road goes. And sure enough, all of a sudden, it dawns on me while there's eight rigs parked there. Cross that off my list. And uh, had I been, been there a day early to scout, I would have known that, but I just showed up the night before, said, oh, I've hunted here a time or two. Everything will be just fine, and off off I'll go. Well, so much for that. So with that one, I folded up the tent by 10 in the morning and said, I got to go find some new spots. So, mm-hmm. but, so what else we got? Go for it. Um, well, are we trying to uh, stay elk specific? I mean, uh, there's a lot. We, I we, think we can, there's we a can lot go of anywhere. On I mean, Wait, I I know one of them. We have a a Dairy Queen uh, <laughs> uh, question somewhere in there. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Um, Let's see. This one is: What is one of your favorite things that you've learned off of Hunt Talk? That I've learned off from Hunt Talk. So Hunt Talk is our big talk forum. Go to hunttalk.com and thousands and thousands of the most badass Western hunters. I feel so second rate out on hunt talk. I'm like such an amateur compared to some of those guys. Uh, but what's the best thing I've ever learned out on hunt talk? Huh? That's a good question. Cause I've been a member on hunt talk since 2002, I think. So what's that 15 years? What's the best thing I've ever learned? Can I come back to that one? That's, I bet you it's an equipment piece. <laughs> I, I get, I, I'll say it, it's it's probably a multitude of equipment pieces uh, of just little things that I pick up there from, from guys who talk about equipment and gear. Uh, some of the most serious abusers of hunting gear hang out on Hunt Talk. And I would bet if you went through my pack on some of those bag dumps that we did mm-hmm. uh, out on YouTube, I would bet a lot of those are the result of guys i really trust out on hunt talk talking about yeah i use this or showing a picture of it or how they use it so yeah that's i'll go with that okay (laughs) (laughs) Uh, what do we got matthew come on we got we got a roll here we 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 got 200 questions to get through in uh, less than two hours well we're gonna be here for a while then (laughs) um how early is too early to start scouting uh I think we kind of covered that. Did we cover that on the last podcast? I think so. That's what I was starting to notice too on this sheet is a lot of these questions are Similar almost rehashing some of the stuff we covered. Some of the covered. same stuff. Especially so, when you have these drawn out answers. Yeah, for think. anyone who didn't uh, listen to how we touched on that last time is for elk as opposed to deer or antelope, I wouldn't necessarily start scouting to find the elk. I, I wouldn't be there in June or July. Maybe if I had an early season tag that started in August, I would. But the the further away from your season date that you're scouting, the less applicability it has for elk on the day you're going to start hunting. So I prefer to extend or use my scouting days as an extension of the hunt. I'll show up two or three days early before season starts, and that's when I'll do my scouting. If you want to come out and and go to your unit and learn the roads learn where the waters are where learn where closed gates and everything else might be i think that's worthwhile but to Mm -hmm. say oh i'm gonna go and look for elk and that's where i'm gonna go hunt them in late october uh 
the odds are they're not going to be in the same spots in late October that you saw them in July. Yeah, it depends so. on your definition of scouting. I mean, right. to yeah. me, there's n- there's no – I mean, you could scout all year round. That right. Just learning different areas, learning what the roads are, like you said, and all that yeah. stuff. I, I would say that there's not a time I'm out – and about when I'm not scouting for something using a wider yeah. definition of scouting, I might be out wolf hunting and I'm really scouting for elk mm-hmm. because I'm hunting someplace that I've always thought about for elk. And so I'm learning kind of the lay of that land or I might be out bear hunting in the spring and I find, Oh wow, look at those game trails going there. That's how they're getting from the summer range to the winter range. Yeah. This is the transition area. So, uh, for antelope, even when I'm driving down the interstate, I'm scouting. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why my wife, she requires that she drives the car when we go through Wyoming. Because I'll never get through Wyoming. I'll stop so many times. Or I almost run us in the ditch. <laughs> Holy cow, did you see that thing? And uh, so she drives through Wyoming because the antelope slow us down. In fact, when you were driving the other day, Matthew, when you came through Wyoming, you sent me a message that said, You'd seen a big whopper buck in yeah. Wyoming. I don't know. Is that a, is that just something you've inherited from me? Or no, I mean, he was 20 yards off the road. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you keep GPS coordinates on it? Uh, no. Oh, well, it's too late anyhow because we'd already done our Wyoming applications this year. So. Yeah. But, all right, what do we got next? Marcus, you got anything on there? Uh, we, so we got pages of sure. it. Sure. So this one is uh, – in terms of calling a biologist to learn about a uh, hunt unit or area, what were what would be some of the questions that you would ask that biologist? Yeah. Well, there's the questions you'd ask, and then there's first, though, the manner of how to go about calling a biologist. Mm-hmm. Do not call a biologist and say, I drew this tag. Can you tell me where to go? <laughs> or can you tell me where a big bull is? They get that question a million times, and if I was in their shoes... I know they're government and employees, so they'd almost, I wouldn't be able to hang up if I was in their shoes, but I'd feel like it. <laughs> be as informed as possible. Do as much of your own research as you can before mm-hmm. you call them. Have your maps, whether it's if you're still an old school paper map guy or if you've got your Onyx map system up on your screen. Have all that taken care of so when you're on the phone with this person, you can be really precise in your questions Uh, just about every state now has hunt planners on their websites most of them will talk about uh, harvest trends most of them will have bull to cow ratios most of them will have something about is the herd growing is it shrinking Uh, colorado has an unbelievable interactive hunting atlas that says here's summer range here's winter range here's migration corridors with what the colorado uh, hunt planner has I don't know why you'd even have to call a biologist. Anything I'd ask as a question is out on that website. Mm -hmm. So not every state is to the level Colorado is with that. Uh, But I want to know things about recent fires, um, even though I can get that off my uh, app with Onyx Maps. Uh, I do want to know about that. I want to know, are there any management issues? Usually I start my question by saying, hey, in my research, this place looks good. And then I want to know, is it overrun with other hunters? Is it some place that water is so scarce that there are no elk in there? or mm-hmm. are, Seasonal are, water things, too. Mm-hmm. Like, is there water, you know, in the summer, but does it dry up by fall? Right. Yeah. St- stuff like that. Things that might be unique to that spot that maybe I wouldn't know until I got there. Mm-hmm. Uh I've found that these biologists, most of them are also hunters. They want to be as helpful as possible. But if you can imagine if, if you're a biologist in some spot and you've got five elk hunting districts you're in charge of, let's say each district gives out a hundred tags. That's 500 hunters who are calling you, or at least a portion of them calling you with information while you still got to get all your other work done. Yeah, not to mention the the deer or if there's bighorn <laughs> sheep or moose right. or mountain well, goats. Those yeah. ones are the ones that people really start talking yeah. about. So I also think that biologists, if they think you're more prepared and you're respectful of their time, 
they're going to give you better answers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll say that even myself. I get so many emails, so many hunt talk messages, private messages. Uh, I don't even answer Facebook messages. So if you've sent me a message on Facebook, just a disclaimer, I don't answer them. Uh, So don't message me on Facebook. But anyhow, when I get those messages, I get a lot of them that say, can you tell me where to go in Colorado? And I usually give them the link to the Colorado website or if they have the questions about Idaho, here's the Idaho website and say, here's the basic thing. Which season are you hunting? Blah, blah, blah. And start from there. Uh, If someone emails me and I can tell, wow, they've done a ton of research. I'm excited to help that person Mm -hmm. because I know they're very vested in their own success. They're interested in it. And uh, they're probably a pretty serious hunter. And maybe someday I'll draw a tag where, hey, <laughs> remember when you asked me about this? You know anything about this area? Um, and I, I guess that comes with experience of interacting with biologists and such. Uh, I I have the benefit of, you know, having drawn a lot of tags in a lot of places over the last 20 some years. So mm-hmm. uh, I've come to understand that these people are busy. They do want to help you, but make it easy for them to help you. So Yeah. A so. follow up to that would be like, do you ever call uh, forest service employees or BLM employees? I do. Like managers of, I mean, not necessarily biologists, I guess is what I'm getting at so, yeah. uh, to get other information. I do. Because yeah. again, a lot of those people are hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I can, if I'm hunting Forest Service and I have an afternoon where I'm going between spots, I might stop in at that Forest Service office yeah. and just say, hey, I'm here looking at the map. You got anyone who can tell me something about this, something about that? And it's amazing how many times someone comes from out, you know, one of the offices in the back when they hear elk being talked about, someone will chime in. Oh, you're going elk hunting, huh? And they want to they want to talk to you because they're elk hunters or deer hunters or whatever. So, yeah. yeah, I the BLM folks they got some amazing range biologists who can tell you so much about what's going on out the on the range yeah. out there. I I would say in most of my mule deer hunts, I always call the BLM range officer uh, or biologist, whether it's a a range manager uh, or an actual wildlife biologist, Mm -hmm. those folks, and and a lot of the mule deer country I hunt is more BLM than it is Forest Service. Uh, They've been invaluable. Uh, And when I have to apply for film permits, (laughs) I have to to apply for a film permit for all of our hunts, uh, whether it's for the Forest Service or the BLM. I always ask that permit officer, got any hunters in your office? Oh, yeah, let me put you in touch with so-and-so. And And, uh, I... I take advantage of that to the extent possible. And I know how busy they are, especially during fire season. Mm -hmm. And fire season in the West usually starts sometime in July and can run until October. I don't bother those people in in fire season. Uh, It's all hands on deck. Uh, And so if that person is, is in one of those agencies and it's August and they're not returning your call, don't get mad at them. Mm -hmm. It's that they're out on a fire for six weeks. 14-hour yeah. days doing work that none of us want to do. <laughs> yeah. So The times that it's helped me, too, is just figuring out what the status of roads are. Because if there's not a travel huge. plan map for that area or there's not – or you don't know how to get that resource, like yeah. you're looking at a map and you're like, well, how do I know if these roads are open? How do I know if what's if it's a good road, if it's a really, you know, ATV trail or something? Yeah. So. I And I'll ask those same people, what's the compliance like? Yeah. Because a lot of times they have one uh, enforcement officer for five districts on their forest. Well, the, a lot of people will know ah, that person can't be out places at all times. So some places have a low compliance with the travel management plan. Mm-hmm. And I'll ask them, hey, I'm thinking about walking in there, but I don't want to walk in there and hear. Yeah. And usually they'll tell you, you know, we try hard, but there's these six areas that have some low compliance in hunting season. So just just know. And if you find someone in there, let us know. Uh, but mm-hmm. it doesn't always work. So. But uh, in this uh, 
this elk talk live thing these are the kind of questions that we're getting uh a little bit of history of how it started is the folks at Botech got a hold of me and said randy we are looking for someone to do a live q a on elk hunting and you've been shooting our bows forever would you be willing to do this and so i bounced it off both you guys i bounced it off some of our other partners and Leupold said, yeah, let's, let's do that. The more information people have, the better. Let's, let's lower the hurdles. Uh, so talk to the Elk Foundation. They said, yeah, we're in. Uh, so uh, every Wednesday night, 8 o'clock mountain time. So what's that, 10 Eastern and 10 seven, Eastern, yeah. 7 Pacific. Uh, go to any of the Facebook pages that I, that I talked about, uh, Randy Newberg Hunter, uh, Botech or Leupold. And... Uh, Elk Foundation is streaming it on their website, not not on their Facebook page. And tons of prizes being given away. In June, we're giving away a set of binos and a rangefinder, but probably the big prize for June is with Botex throwing out a Rain 7, the new smart bow they have. And I think we're going to have a prize package similar to that every month. So if you're listening to this podcast and you want to get more elk content, uh, satisfy your elk appetite uh wednesday nights and if you don't catch it on wednesday nights we're throwing those up on our youtube channel so you can watch it after the fact or you can go to to the to the facebook pages and and watch it there also um and the elk foundation is trying to figure out they want to put together like a really really big package uh for anyone who enters and we're still working on the details on that uh, but how, I, how do you go about entering Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what everyone wants to know right Everyone's now. like, gee, Randy. Good question. Uh, so what you do is uh, you can, uh, there's details on our Hunt Talk site. There's details on all the partner sites. But the easy way, if you want to, what it is, is you don't got to buy anything, nothing like that. You just text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to the number 313131. And uh, you'll get notified and you'll be in the drawing. Uh, it's is that and that signs you up for notifications notifications as well for of when we're going live yeah. and then also uh gets you in the drawing for everything and then there the online all of us on our websites have a form where if you don't want to do the text one you can click and say all right here's my email address i want to get notified via email and you're in the drawing so uh and then loophole just sent me one of their uh i think it's like a, they call it a slingo uh, it's like a sling pack uh we're going to be giving that away on the next elk talk uh, live and then botex is going to be giving away a bunch of uh gift cards and stuff for their store so uh hopefully people chime in but anyhow i thought i better get to how you can sign up before we get too far into this (laughs) podcast so yeah but what's our next question uh it says the last couple of years in colorado the first rifle season has been very warm any thoughts on how to see more elk when the weather is warmer than expected yeah go to where it's cooler (laughs) i I, and i say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek but the i don't know if i have that book here i think it's in the other bookshelf but i have jack ward thomas's book uh i think it's called elk is it elk and elk ecology is that it? I'm not Anyhow, sure. it's this big textbook on elk. And it talks about how much energy an elk burns to stay cool in, when they have their winter coat on and it's a hotter period in the fall. And that's absolutely critical that they end up someplace that is cool. And that can be canyons, that can be north facing slopes, that can be dark timber, it could be a windswept ridge, it could be whatever. But for me, it, when it's that hot, and we're going to get into this, Marcus, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in November in Colorado last year, and, and this doesn't, the, the question was related to Colorado, but it can be any state. Uh, you think about archery hunts. It's a lot of times in September it's hot. But uh, last year in November, I think across the West was one of the warmest Novembers I've ever seen. And I had that third season tag in Colorado. And those elk were down, buried in the absolute bottom of canyons. Yeah. The places nobody wanted to get to. So 
if you have a tag and it's hot and unseasonably warm, find these sanctuary areas. And this is assuming that you're hunting a post-rut period or late season. Find these sanctuary places that are on north slopes, down in canyons, have some dark timber nearby. I mean, it doesn't have to be this 30-mile expanse of carpet of dark timber, but some place that is cooler. Yeah, Uh, because those canyons were... They have to be shaded for a lot of the day. This gets yeah. how steep and down they are. So. Yeah. And uh, then also you get in those spots and they funnel a breeze. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you get in a constricted area, uh, even if it's the saddle in a mountain, you know, or two. And, and this is another thing we take for granted. When I came out, when I moved out west in 1984, when people said a saddle, I'm like, what the hell is a saddle? <laughs> Well, it's for those of you listening who don't know, it's where two mountains come together and form a lower spot. Uh, some people would call it a pass. Uh, but any place geography can funnel a wind, I've found that elk like to bed there for two reasons. They'll put the wind at their back because there's always a favorable wind there for where they're bedded, and that wind cools them off. Um, mm-hmm. It's remarkable. It's like, why are there always elk here on a warm day? Well... Because that funnel or that saddle pass, whatever, creates this funnel effect and it constricts the airflow and the rate of the the speed of the wind right there is always 15 miles an hour, which is way cooler than going and land someplace that's stagnant and muggy and whatever. So I, I don't know if that answers the person's question, but if it's hot, elk need to stay cool at that time of year because they have their winter coat. Don't be looking at south slopes of any sort, southeast, southwest, straight south. Uh, Don't necessarily go and look in these big flats where the sun is baking. Find some little break to the terrain, probably a canyon, and they're going to be in those kind of places. So so shifting a little bit to CDS scopes from Leupold, Uh um, what would be a good elevation to put on your CDS ballistics Mm -hmm. um so that you could not worry about it too much no matter where you're at in the west right so cds uh, leupold makes this system and then people been seeing them on our tv show and website now for probably six years whenever they came out with them seven years ago and it stands for custom dial system and what it is it's a turret that goes on and it uh, it's really your elevation turret and some people like dots some people like uh you know they like to have their their dope charts on the stock of their rifle whatever and i get that for me for normal shooting ranges or hunting ranges i've not found anything that's as easy and effective just just as simple as the loophole cds system and there's a reason why they sell so many of them as anyone who uses them is like well why did i wait so long to have that um and you can add them to most any scope that they sell now right? yeah pretty much and and a lot of them you just buy it as a scope that already comes with the cds style but they need to know uh what speed your bullet is traveling obviously what load you have is it 165 grain nozzler partition 308 blah 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 uh they need to know the ballistic coefficient of the bullet uh sectional density of the bullet stuff like that um, and then they want to know what's your normal air temperature and what's your normal altitude that you're hunting at. And, and knowing full well that altitude and temperature are going to change. If, if you have them etch that dial for that, say, 6,000 feet elevation and 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you're never going to be at the perfect place where it's 6,000 yeah. feet elevation and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So <clears throat> I, I usually, if it's an elk hunting bullet, I usually have mine uh, set for 7,500 feet and 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So that said, I go and I, there you can go online and there's all kinds of charts that talk about how much altitude will affect the, the, from what your point of aim is yeah and what your uh, uh air temperature will affect from what your your point of aim is mm-hmm. so um some people say well i'm just going to go and get it for wherever i live and cite it in there 
Um, and I do that with a bunch of my dials also because I live at 5,000 feet. And if I have a dial set for 7,500 and I go and, and zero it in at 5,000 feet, I'm already off a little bit. Hmm. Just because the way those dials are set. Right. That if I zero at 100 at 5,000 feet, when I move up and say it's a 100-yard shot at 7,500, the air is thinner. I'm gonna my point of aim. My point of impact is gonna be a little bit higher. Okay. So you extend that out to 400, 500 yards, and you know, most hunting ranges, none of this really matters. That's what that's, I was gonna. That's yeah. Off the top of your head, do you know like are we talking like say we're, 300 we're, yards? We're, I'm six, talking. Maybe we're talking yards. about an inch. An inch. Okay. In most of these things, in yeah. my the places I hunt from sea level to 10,000 feet, from zero degrees to 60 degrees most of these won't affect it more than an inch okay so i so pick a happy medium and yeah no don't have an idea of what it does but don't overthink it right know it's, what it, know what your gear does basically right that that's the so. good point don't overthink it um and it's it's not the end of the world one way or the other um I mean, right there is a brand new loophole box with the CDS dial on the top of it, uh, but they can't see that on the podcast, yeah. so it yeah. would only apply to the video. Yeah. But that's for me. It, it is so simple. I I call it click dial and shoot because so many times we have guest hunters who are using our rifles mm-hmm. and they're, they're not familiar with them. We gotta. It's you're already throwing a lot of variables at it at someone whether they're an experienced hunter or an inexperienced hunter uh you give them a rifle they've never shot you're asking for (laughs) i I don't even say you're asking but you're putting them in a tougher spot so having these dials is so easy because then i don't have to say oh at 320 yards you got to hold eight inches high well if i'm comfortable with that rifle i probably know exactly what eight inches high really is Mm mm-hmm how nice is it when I can just say, hey, spin that dial to 320. Hold that on and call it good. Uh, I mean, like when we were in the, on the Mueller hunt last year in uh, Nevada, uh, Mike Spitzer was with us. That was a long shot he made at that buck, and he laid down. Mm-hmm. He spun that dial, and uh, kaboom. But Mike shoots a lot too, right? Well, right. Mike <laughs> shoots a lot. <laughs> he, that's part of his profession is, is shooting, but – point of that is i and and when i really have a good shooter like mike and i hand him the rifle i'm like oh no what if he misses what if i've set something wrong on the rifle what if i've not done my job of getting this rifle ready uh knock on wood (laughs) to this point i don't know that we've ever had a guest hunter miss just you yeah (laughs) (laughs) what's that say (laughs) so uh going back to the the cds dials you can also just tell them what factory load you're shooting as well right yeah you you can you can i would suggest you run them through a chronograph um i shoot nosler ammunition and when we chrono that stuff the variances are so so small as far as feet per second i mean (laughs) i don't think you could hand load and get any more consistency out of it and then I compare that to what, because they put a ballistics chart on their box. And you can go online to nosler.com and download their ballistics charts. Mm-hmm. Um, when we chrono those, it's so close to what is reported. I suspect if you sent it in and said, here's the Nosler chart, and gave them the elevation and temperature you want your dial for, they could probably build it right from that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you should practice enough so that you know right you know at the the cds styles to make sure that what you gave them is is doing the thing you want it to yeah. do if so, practice 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 yeah and it, people say that's easy for you to say randy ammo is free for you yeah it is but i practice a lot and we're going to be doing a bunch of youtube clips on this marcus because in elk hunting well all hunting for that matter but elk hunting you don't get bench rests I mean, maybe you'll luck out and you'll find a big flat rock you can lay your pack on, and it feels like bench rest. But we uh, we're going to be doing a bunch of videos this summer about 
to your point, Matthew, you practice and practice with, with your hunting equipment, but also practice in hunting situations. We're, Marcus and I are talking, we're waiting for the next crappy, windy day, and we're going out to the range because I want to know what my load does when I've got a variable wind between <clears throat> 15 and 30 miles an hour. I want to know what it does when it's raining, all that kind of stuff. So that that gets to the practice part of it is, yeah, practice, but practice in a way that's going to be helpful for true hunting conditions. So but. This chair is. <laughs> you got anything over there, Marcus? Uh, Sure. So <laughs> this one is, do you have some ideas for guys with more money than time and then some ideas with – guys that have more time than money (laughs) oh well that's what they always say you either have too much time and not enough money or too much money and not enough time and Uh, i i would assume that they're uh asking a a hunting related yeah (laughs) i think so well if you had more time than or more money than anything i guess you just get out your checkbook and pay these ridiculous amounts to go do whatever that's I, I can't really uh, comment on that because I'm not one of those guys who has too much money. Uh, I'm kind of like the dime store hunter. I got to figure out how to do it on the cheap. Um, so I, but I can talk about the guy who's maybe got more time and less money. And that is just the stuff that we do. I'm always surprised how often people think what we're doing is an $8,000 hunt or a $5,000 hunt. I don't think any of the hunts we do, driving from Bozeman, Montana to wherever we go, counting tags, counting everything else, if you split that cost, that travel, and everything among two or three guys, I don't think any of them would be more than 2000 bucks. Depends on how many Dairy Queens you get, I think. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you know, people can count, cross that off their budget. And, but to that point, you know, if I want to really go, I did this article and it was, it's been quite a few years ago. So it's, uh, prices have increased some, but it was for the elk foundation. It was how to go elk hunting for a thousand bucks. Uh, since then Colorado has raised their tag fee. So now I'd probably have to say how to go elk hunting for 1500 bucks if I redid the article, but uh, w- don't stay in a fancy motel. You know, if you got three guys rotate driving and just drive straight through. Or, and a lot of times I've done this, the number of times I've thrown my cot out uh, on a little spur road, you know, driving down the interstate and it says ranch access here. I'll drive a half mile off the interstate, throw my cot out and I'll spend the night <laughs> sleeping right there. Uh, and it saves me a hundred bucks. Meals, uh, I hate, one, I hate the time it takes to eat crappy restaurant food. I hate how my body feels when I eat crappy restaurant field, uh, f- food, and I hate how my pocketbook feels when I do that. <laughs> so when we head out, usually my wife has baked a couple loaves of uh, banana bread. Uh, a bunch of We have a bunch of meat sticks and teriyaki sticks, pepper sticks of, of meat. We got some fruit and vegetables that we've cut up. And that's enough food to get you to where you're going. Uh, So there's just so many things that I see people waste money on when they're going on hunts there. You could have went on two hunts instead of one. But that that assumes they have time to go on two hunts (laughs) instead of one. But so I don't know if that answers the person's question, but to to think that you have to have uh, gobs of money to go do this stuff and it's not the case. Um, it, it just isn't. So, uh, so next question. Um, we've talked about this on a couple other podcasts. How did you get started filming hunts and what kind of equipment would you recommend for getting the best footage? All right. I'm going to start with the last part first, because Marcus <laughs> is working on a video. You're going to find out what a perfectionist Marcus is, because how long have you been trying to perfect this video i've i keep getting other projects to sidetrack me is really true is really the problem okay but (laughs) but i've i've at the office i've watched marcus working on this and so what what we did is we went out and shot a video that i didn't we decide it's going to end up being two or three videos yeah i think three so 
we've and it's going to be coming out on youtube where marcus says here's what we use to film and we don't expect people to to use what we do both from a cost standpoint from a technical standpoint they don't have a film degree like you do uh lugging all that stuff around while trying to hunt and yeah it's just not gonna work well that's the problem with that question is it doesn't really uh it says to get the best footage. Like, well, right. do you have two hundred thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> to hire somebody to haul your right. camera gear for you? Right. So, so you're right. Uh, the, without a putting generic. a budget to it, it's hard to say. So the other part of our video series that Marcus is is working on is here's what you can do if you had a thousand dollar budget, and a lot of this, you know. It, you don't have to break the bank. If you already have, let's say, a tripod for your spotting scope, just go get another plate, another adapter, and use that as your tripod for your video camera. Now you've solved the, the stabilized footage problem without incurring a bunch more money. There, maybe you want a second uh, point of view or a second uh, shot angle. All right, you might have a point and shoot video cam or a digital uh, camera that shoots video. You know what? Set that up somewhere and make that your second angle. Yeah, They're, it just depends on every situation and like what hunt are they filming? What right. is it? What archery? do they already is have? It? What I mean, there's like there's so many factors that come into play. There's no like one. Right. video camera that's just going to be perfect for everybody no it doesn't. and we've done it enough that we know if someone carries something that's too big or too complex it's going to stay in their pack for three days and then it's going to stay in camp every day after that because they're tired of lugging it around yeah they, they need something that's small and handy and easy to use that almost can be run on auto yeah, yeah. so a guy came out with a book a couple of years back about the iPhone camera, some mm -hmm. titled something along the lines of the best camera is the one you have with you. Hmm. And so if you don't have anything with you, you're not going to film any of the, the hunting. And so it has to have that right combination of features so that you can actually use it, but also light enough and compact enough that you're actually going to bring it with you. Yeah. yeah. So... No, I've, I've, I've fallen into that trap myself. I went and bought a mirrorless camera with four lenses. <laughs> Guess what? Three of the lenses stay in camp now. Yep. <laughs> it's, so the, the, to answer that question, I guess, follow along on our YouTube channel once we start putting that in there. We're going to give you the whole range of here's how crazy and expensive it can be based on what we use. But here's what's more practical. And like Marcus was saying, if... If you were doing a tree stand hunt, you can get by with a whole lot more than if you're running and gunning archery hunting. Yeah. And just, it's so, uh, so hard to, to answer that in, in one answer. The first part of the question, and we have talked about it on, I think it was podcast number seven or something like Six, that. Six, I think. Something. And that's how did I get into this? And it's right there. Matthew is the reason. And this couch I'm sitting on is the other reason. Uh, we're filming this up in the Randy room at my house, or recording it. And I have this weird liver condition. When was that? 2005, I think. <sighs> Went back to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and they said, "Dude, you're sick. You're just gonna rest for three months." I laid on this couch watching that TV over there for three months, watching outdoor TV. And that was not medicinal. In, <laughs> it was not therapeutic in any way. And Matthew was, what were you, the teacher's assistant in the editing class here at yeah, the high school? Yeah, there was a digital video editing class at the high school that I yeah. was in. And so one day Matthew comes home and we're playing cribbage, and I made some comment about the quality of outdoor TV, and he said, oh, Dad, we can do better than that. I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm sick laying on this couch, and they're on TV. And I was way over-medicated at the time, and Matthew and I debate how this happens. I believe Matthew con convinced my wife to buy all this production gear because if I would have done it, I'd be divorced right now. 
but he got by with it. So with that, we were in the video business and we went around filming each other and filming friends and we had this great idea for a DVD. As funny as that is now that we're doing everything on YouTube. And When was YouTube? When did they come out? 2005? Mm, I think, think that's a little later. Oh, well, anyhow. Was, I don't know. We thought yeah. we had it figured out. Boy, we were going to sell DVDs. Boy, what what a learning experience. Anyhow, I think it was 2000, summer or winter of 2007, 2008. Uh, I went to the shot show and got laughed out of there. So I came home, pretty much folded up the tent, sold all of that gear, decided, oh, I'm just going hunting. Matthew's going off to college this year, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Matthew had built this sizzle reel that a production company got a hold of. And uh, they tried to talk me into it. I just told them I ain't doing that. I stiff armed them. And finally, they are so persistent. I'm like, what? Okay, tell me what you have in mind. And uh, so they said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll film it. And da -da -da, you sign the contract if you like it. Well, they came with me on three hunts, I think it was. And I saw what they did. I'm like, whoa, these guys know what they're doing. And uh, I, so I signed the contract. And that was stupid because I signed it in late September for them to produce it. And this was a big contract. Signed a contract for $300,000 for them to produce a whole year of TV. And two weeks later... In 2008, October, the stock market completely craps the bed. So all these sponsors that this production company and I had been working on, they were cutting marketing budgets like crazy. So guess who got to write the check for that contract? On Your Own Adventures, LLC, with no sponsorship revenue. <laughs> uh, so that's how I got into it. And then uh, we... We bounced around from Outdoor Channel, Sportsman's Channel, and then, uh, Marcus, you've been with us now for two years, is it? Uh, two? Oh, I, over a year, I guess. I worked part-time for yeah. a while, just kind of right. starting out. Yeah, so it was about two years ago you started part-time, and then you went full-time last year. And then somewhere along the way, uh, Matthew convinced us to do the YouTube gig. Uh, when I was approached to do a podcast by 0.0, .0 uh, Matthew told me I was an idiot if I didn't do it or something to that effect. So that's how we ended up with all these things, how we got into it. Um, it's not easy. It is it is a job. Uh, Marcus and Michael, the other camera guy, they work long hours. They, you, you, I think there's a perception that all we do is just go out and hunt. <laughs> and really... I would say if you took the hours during the year that we hunt compared to the hours we work and do all the other stuff, we probably spend, I don't know, one hour hunting. For for every one hour hunting, we spend two or three hours doing the other kind of work. Which yeah. probably isn't any, I'm sure you still have a high percentage of time that you're hunting compared to most people. Right, yeah, and I'm sure <laughs> a lot of people say, well, gee, Randy, I feel sorry for you, and I'm not saying it to... <laughs> To be, you know, I don't want anyone's sympathy or sorrow, but I do get a lot of questions from people who want to get into the industry. And I tell them, you better have a really good stick. You better have a lot of money uh, to see yourself through the hard times. You, it better not be what you need for your mortgage payment and your groceries. Uh, and you better be bullheaded. If I was not so bullheaded, I would have folded this tent the first year. But I'm just too bullheaded, so you know I don't know if that answers the person's question. But it's yeah. a lot more fun now that you have the podcast and YouTube it, and everything. It, it is, and uh, you know we've been advertising that we're going to be on Amazon here pretty soon, and we sent everything into Amazon. Matthew got it all loaded up, and then they what they say that it had too much promotional content in it. Yeah, some so. some technical thing that they didn't like. So how we did it. So still working on it. Yeah. We'll have that done by the end of the month. Hopefully they'll give us the good housekeeping seal of approval by that time. So, but anyhow, enough of that. Marcus, you got, you got three sheets. Uh, there. There's gotta be well, something there. That I don't know for, there's political questions. There's 
questions we'll, about we'll outdoor lay TV. Off. Let, let's, let's lay <laughs> off the politics <laughs> for, for this one. I think that's why I skipped over a bunch of them. Not, not that politics is going away anytime soon, but it's just this one I want want it to be just informational, fun, sitting around the campfire telling stories. Uh. All right. This, there's one about pack hunting, essentially, when how do you feel about people who, uh, where one person has the tag and then there's, you know, seven other people out there hunting along with them. Okay. How about your thoughts on pack hunting? The mentality when people draw a premier tag, each tag holder has six of his buddies scouring the unit for the biggest buck, bull, or ram. Is this really a problem? I've never had a tag where it occurs, and if so, is there anything we can do about it? Well... I don't know if it's a problem or not either. Uh, I've encountered it. Uh, you know, there's times where we we're out filming, and uh, some people find out we're there, and so they set up a camp next to us. And then sometimes we've got people tagging along with us, and so it, maybe it looks like we're pack hunting because there's four of us together, and we only That's got true. one tag. And it's not that we're out there trying to do whatever. Uh, it just kind of how it turns out. But I think I know what the person is talking about. Um, in some states where you don't get to hunt very often uh, or it's just an unbelievable once in five lifetime tags, you'll you, say it's a big horn sheep tag. You'll get a whole bunch of people there wanting to help. And I personally, I don't have a problem with it. It's... If that's what the tag holder wants, hey, I want my three buddies and their cousins and their brothers or whatever to come with, you know what? <laughs> Knock yourself out. Now, if it gets to the point where any of those people start becoming possessive of, hey, we were here first, <laughs> so that you bring eight guys just so you can kind of, quote, unquote, lay claim to eight different drainages, nah, that that's not what it's about. So I don't... I don't know. Maybe people have a different opinion about it, but I I don't see it as a problem. So, all right, I've got one. Uh, so I've heard you say to Eastern whitetail guys, just go get an over-the-counter tag and go elk hunting. I don't have a hunting partner who is as serious as me, and I am a bit intimidated by finding a spot. What is your advice? Uh, well, find some better buddies first of all. If <laughs> if, if, if your hunting buddies can't be talked into going elk hunting, they're really not hunting buddies. You know, they're they're soccer fans or they golf or something else. I that that'd be my first answer. Uh, but then, uh, as far as if you can't get anybody to go with you, uh, it represents a bigger challenge because if you're traveling from quote unquote a whitetail state like he mentions. Your travel costs are going to be higher because you don't have a group of people to split them with. Uh, your workload at camp is going to be higher because you don't have a group of people to split the, the work chores with. Um, but every year there are people who come out here and do solo hunts in the West, and they they get it done. Uh, or they maybe they don't fill a tag, but they have a fun time. Uh, I do know that... If you can find a state or a spot or a season or a species where you can come year after year, even if you're going solo, the first year might be a heavy learning curve. The second, that, that learning curve starts to flatten pretty good and keep coming. And sooner or later, you'll figure it out and you'll end up, if you go find a good spot, good unit that, I mean, it's maybe it is an over the counter unit, but there's still some good over the counter units. Um, you might end up knowing more about that area than the locals if you put that on your calendar and spend a week in there hunting every year. So, a Yeah, I think I, a big piece of advice would be to not be afraid of failure. I mean, yeah. just because I think so many people are like, oh man, if I go all the way out there, I just I have to kill an elk. But I mean, yeah. if I guess it, it is a big investment, maybe you can only do it one year. But if it's possible, I imagine if you can do it multiple years in a row. Just don't be afraid of failing. And yeah. I, I you'll mean, eventually it, you'll get one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and for people who are afraid of failure, I, I, here's a perfect example. Marcus and I have spent the last 12 days hunting for bears in Montana, right here in my backyard. And we've yet to kill one. So. Spoiler alert. 
<laughs> if you're watching the live, <laughs> the live YouTube series, yeah, still at They'll day twelve. They'll all be live, but uh, yeah, yeah that the, the last one will be up tomorrow. So, but the the point of that is that, uh, and some would say, well, yeah, that's fine, Randy. You haven't invested a week of your vacation and all this money, and and so it's no big deal. Well, I'm saying that so that people don't have don't buy into this artificial expectation that every hunt is easy every hunt has success because if you just base it on what you might see on tv we're taking and all shows are taking multiple days of hunting and compressing it into 20 some minutes mm -hmm. and so you you cut out all the boring times all the times when nothing's happening and so and, and a lot of shows, not us, but a lot of shows, just if it, they don't kill something, that gets thrown away. So it feeds this perception, I think, that this is easier than it really is. Yeah. Public but, public land elk hunting is the hardest thing we do. I, yeah. I, I don't know what else I could do that would be harder than public land elk hunting. Yeah. But that's the thing. Even if you don't kill anything, the experience alone, at least for me, and I yeah. imagine for you as well, is just... It's awesome being outside and being in those places. Like yeah. those last 12 days, bear hunting, we saw so many cool things. Yeah. We saw so many animals. I saw a harlequin duck. i never seen a harlequin before. That was sweet. Yeah. I, all sorts of stuff that, Yeah, it's, I mean. And you, so if you can look at that as part of the value of the trip, there's no trip that's ever a waste yeah. in, in my mind. You can also try to combine, say, an elk hunt with a deer hunt or something. If yeah, if you can swing that, then if you're, you know, out elk hunting and you're growing frustrated and you're not finding anything, maybe you can go, go half hunt. a mile down the road instead and find some deer or something. So. Yeah, I mean, and we're blessed with that in Montana yeah. because I, um, a lot of our non-resident tags, even our elk deer combo tags. So to to your point, Matthew. It, yeah. You you can combine the two. Other states, it, it's harder because you, you got to draw the deer tag and then draw or or the elk tag and draw it in the same unit. But there's there's so many things that that go into it that can still be fun. And I just look at it as a continual learning uh, process. Um, this bear hunt is really a learning process for me. <laughs> uh, I, I wish it wasn't, but it's turning out to be that way. <laughs> yeah. But really it comes down to just make sure that you enjoy it. Like, yeah, if, if you don't enjoy it, if you put that much pressure on yourself and I'm speaking from experience, I have went on hunts where I put way too much pressure on myself and yeah, it was okay. But it wasn't nearly as fun as the hunts where I just show up and say, you know what, I'm here to have a good time. I want to see some cool country. I'm going to try this. I'm going to experiment with that. I'm going to, you know, bring someone along who's fun to be with. Never bring along someone who's a sourpuss. Never have anyone in your camp who's a pessimist. Because as Mark Twain says, pessimists are seldom disappointed. They, if you, If it's always going to be the darkest hour, and you're a pessimist, guess what? You'll, it'll probably always be the darkest hour. And I, I, I just don't want those people around something like hunting that is that important to me. So uh, I don't know. that That's my best effort to answer that question. So, All right. Uh, next one up. What times of day during a late season hunt do you have the most success? Is it worth being out all day in the cold, glassing in case a bull gets up in the middle of the day? Oh, I think we did answer that one on uh, that live, uh, that Elk Talk Live Q&A series. I think so. Yeah. All right, well, 30-second right. answer. Then. Sure, 30-second <laughs> answer is I'm there all day long. And if I'm getting cold and it's in November, I build a fire. And I'm, uh, what else am I going to do? Go back to the <laughs> tent? It, I that, that part always cracks me up when I'm, uh, you know, maybe I, I go, I have a morning spot. And then I have an evening spot or an afternoon spot. And I drive by these camps and everybody's already back to camp at 10 in the morning. And they aren't heading out again till 3 in the afternoon. I'm like, okay, that's that's how you want to do it. That, that's not my style. but So I don't know if it, it's probably up to each person about how long they want to stay out there. But the, the simple answer is the longer you're there, the more time you're spending looking through that glass, the greater 
the odds of success. And I know mentally the expectations or the the frustrations can drive you away from that. But it's just, I, I think public land elk hunting is as much a mental game as it is a physical game. Yeah, I, for m- sure. My thought, anyhow. Because I'm not very physical. I, I drive a desk for a living. So <laughs> if a fat 52-year-old, gray-haired, out-of-shape accountant with a bum liver can consistently find elk on public land, anybody can. That's that's the way I look at it. I'm, I'm such a low hurdle to to step over that if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, What do we got, Marcus? Got any more? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a few more, but if you have anything handy. we got a lot of uh, political stuff over here. <laughs> All right. Um, I, yeah, I can keep going for a bit then. So I'm going to let I'm, – I'm going to force Marcus's hand on some of these also because he gets to elk hunt a lot. He grew up elk hunting. Uh, so he's going to get to answer some too. All right. Um, so recently you've made a fairly major switch to the Hala Alpine mountain rifles, which are mm-hmm. the lighter weight version. Yep. Uh, this question basically says, does the recoil bother you on the lighter weight rifles? I've always carried a heavier rifle, but I'm tempted to go to a lighter weight one. Right. So when how I started their research on the Alpine mountain rifle, they wanted, they said, all right, we want something that weighs five pounds, whatever, empty and dry. Uh, I think it was five pounds, six ounces or five pounds, 10 ounces. So here's what we got to come up with. Well, to, to save weight, you got to come up with a short action caliber. Full long action calibers are hard. It just, your receiver's longer. You got to build a or should build a sturdier <laughs> everything for for the full magnum caliber. So right there kind of crosses those a little bit off the list. Well, short action calibers built on the 308 uh, cartridge, that being 308, 7 mm 8 243, all that, uh, those are pretty modest in recoil. Um, I have the the original number one prototype that, that Howa was, was uh, working from. They sent it to me. And that thing, it's in a 7mm08, and that has killed so much stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, it's killed a couple bears. It's killed lots of deer, whitetail and mule deer. Uh, it killed a mountain goat. Um, I never noticed the recoil, not even when I'm out at the bench. Now, I've got some people who say, well, I'll stay with a longer action, and I'll trim down this and here and there, and I'll put a brake on it. That's how I'll manage recoil. My theory is if you need a break on a rifle, you've got the wrong combination. I, for a couple, well, uh, you ever stand next to a break, a, ri- a break rifle? If, if someone shows up around us with a break rifle, they get sent home. You aren't, leave that thing in the truck. You I mean, are, we, we show up to the range to practice and oftentimes we'll, you know, cut our practice short if somebody else is shooting a braked rifle even if it's five stands down just because it's so loud and yeah and you get underneath the canopy that is there for shade and and rain and that sound just or that that noise vibration it just it's almost like you're in a tube or a tunnel with it so my theory is with hunting rifles if you need a break on it then you might want to rethink what you have as a hunting rifle. And now I'm going to get a million emails from folks who disagree, and that's fine. It's whatever works for everybody else. But for this person's question, uh, all those How Alpine Mountain Rifles come in short action cartridges. Uh, and a 308, I shoot 165 grain Nosler partition, Nosler trophy grade ammo out of that. You add that scope to it, you fill it with three rounds and i would bet the whole package at that point now weighs a little over seven pounds uh with everything dressed out i don't notice anything never been a problem or a bother i mean when you're out in the field getting ready to shoot something most of the time you don't notice recoil anyway yeah most of the time when you care about recoil is when you're at the range you know practicing sighting in and that's probably where you'd develop a flinch or anything if it was going to be an issue. Yeah. And there, you know, there are ways you can get around that. Yeah. Shoulder pads or sleds or right. things because like that. Because we were talking about it this morning, Matthew. You were looking at that 300 win mag cartridge and you said, man, I can't believe I've been shooting this all the time. 
Uh, it's your favorite thing to yeah. shoot. You, I'm, I still like the 300 Win Mag. It's, it's done very well for me. Right. You've shot <laughs> multiple elk and everything else. And I've often wondered, I mean, when you were in high school, you're 15 years old, you shot this bull up here on the wall. What were you, five foot eight, hundred and thirty pounds? Yeah, something like that. And you shot that with the three hundred Win Mag. Yeah. It, so didn't notice, but I mean, everyone's gonna have different recoil sensitivity, sensitivity too. Right, and um, um, and I think to your point though, when you're out hunting, you don't really notice it. I I don't anyhow. But if I'm standing next to somebody and they got a break, because when you're hunting, the other guy next to you has got his binos out. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on him. And all of a sudden, kaboom, you feel like a bazooka just whizzed by your head or something. It, yeah, my hearing's already bad enough. I don't need to be around a break. So, I, And I know that person wasn't talking about a brake rifle. They were talking about recoil. But a lot of people manage recoil via putting a brake on it. And I just, I'm not going there. I don't don't want anything to do with it. So, you got a thought, different thought on that, Marcus? Uh, no, not really. I carry a really heavy rifle, and it's uh, a three thirty eight Win Mag. So, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah isn't <laughs> you said that's the one your grandpa gave? Yeah, you? he gave that to me. Well, if I had a, a an elk rifle that a grandfather gave me, I'd be pretty partial <laughs> to that also. But none of my grandfathers had ever hunted elk, so. Mm-hmm. Um, any, are you planning any videos of prepping food or dehydrating, dehydrating meals for backpack hunts in the future? Or do you have some advice around that? Didn't, I wonder if they're referring to the one we did about the lasagna. So there's a video out there about how we make, uh, homemade lasagna. Uh, we make it at home in big we, bulk. We, we, mom. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> my wife. Um, and so she makes it. I put it in food saver, vacuum sealed bags. We seal it. We freeze it. And when we go out on the road, we have a whole Orion cooler full of homemade meals that way. Because the quality of the food's better. Uh, not just in taste, but the nutrition of the food is better. And so we, we, out on our YouTube channel, there there's a video about that. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to do any more. Uh, I'd love to. We did one of them. Oh, we did a video about cooking muskrats. Yeah. You could just do different <laughs> recipes or something. Yeah. Just, that'd be and there, there's a couple thoughts to that. Is Scott Laseth, uh, he's a, a cooking chef. Uh, he's got some really great videos. Um, so I, I almost feel like this is such a an area outside of any type of expertise that I would have. And for me, when I do videos on this, it's going to be simple. When we're out there, I don't want a lot of cleanup time. I don't want a lot of prep time. We are so tired because we've hunted all day. We're up way before daylight, getting back way after dark. It's got to be really simple for me. Um, and so maybe my bias towards that causes me to, to have a really bland uh, palate related to to food hank shaw has has the best stuff i know of uh, randy king uh in idaho he's got another really good big game cookbook um i'd like to have those guys come on the youtube channel and do stuff they they're way more qualified than i am <laughs> uh and they're great guys they love to hunt like we do and they understand so much about food and and from from field to to table uh than i do that i i know i (laughs) i i'm pretty low tech when it comes to food so to answer that person's question will i be doing anymore i don't know but marcus you you have an instagram video just this was it this weekend you shot the marmot with your bow that was last night that was last night (laughs) (laughs) uh and you ate it. Yeah, no, we just skinned it right there, threw it on the grill. We already had the grill going. <laughs> the marmot made the, the mistake of coming by. Yeah. Is there anything you haven't eaten? You, yeah. Because when no, I, I haven't had, I haven't tried beaver yet. We were supposed to. I get, know that's my catch fault. Beavers, but then we never got it. Yeah, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but we'll be talking about these food things, and Marcus will come up with some of the things you've eaten 
I'm like, really? You tried that? Yeah, why not? Uh, it, paddlefish, you said, is really good. I like paddlefish, yeah. I didn't draw a tag this year, though, so. Yeah. Missed uh, out on that. Other, you, you said, well, when Kara, your wife, shot her uh, sheep, her, she shot a you. Yeah, yeah. You said that was excellent. It was excellent. really I, good. I've had bighorn ram, and it was super good. I suspect that you might even be slightly better. Yeah, it was really tasty. I don't know. I haven't had a ram. Oh. Or at least not in a long time anyway that I remember. Mountain goat, uh, that one that's on the wall up there, I shot that one. You were five, Matthew, when I shot that one. And I don't know if you even remember. The the flavor was good, but the texture was like chewing on the core of a golf ball. You know, all those rubber bands. (laughs) It was like the more you chewed on it, the bigger it got. And the first time I prepared it, uh, Matthew and I are chewing and grinding and the next morning Matthew gets up he's five years old and he's getting ready for school he's like dad my cheeks hurt (laughs) (laughs) and my wife is like oh let me see you have the mumps or what I'm like no I think it's from chewing on that mountain goat last night (laughs) but maybe I did something wrong with it Uh, I've I've heard mountain goats can be pretty tough big billies yeah yeah like for lunch today, I had an antelope burger. Uh, that was really good. I, I'll cook four or five, six burgers at a time mm-hmm. and put them in the fridge, and then I just warm them up nice. throughout the week because I love antelope that much, and yeah. it's just it's hard to beat. Um, what do you have left in the freezer from last year? I don't have hardly anything left from last year. I got some whitetail. Um I got some bear from two years ago. I do have some antelope. Uh, I, I But all I have left is antelope S- burger. I don't have any steaks left. Uh, I have one package of Sitka blacktail from two years ago. I don't know why. I'm, every time I dig in the freezer, I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to be out of Sitka blacktail. So it sits it. there. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to wait, Randy? Eight years before you finally decide, oh, gee, I'm going to eat this? So... No, nah, I got to do that. We're out of walleyes. My freezer sucks right now. Yeah, walleyes does yours quick. get li- Does yours get like that this time of year? Uh, no, we're we're sitting pretty good still. Are you? Luckily, we we've we've done well the last couple of years. So okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I we're gonna make it. We're gonna you? make it. I think. I mean, I'm gonna make it, but <laughs> man, I. There's just something about when when you hunt and you look at your freezer and you can see the floor of your freezer. It's like this isn't right. I gotta, I gotta shoot a bear. Oh, I don't have any birds left. Um, have some white-tailed deer because you eat so. the birds as soon as you shoot them. Well, I know I, that's I, the problem <laughs> with, I have with walleye. Walleye doesn't get into my freezer hardly ever. Yeah, if I catch wa- a walleye, <laughs> just eating it. Then. Yeah. <laughs> so I think about in the winter time how much wild creatures go through my freezer and, and onto my plates onto my grill i i don't think i cook anything in the kitchen uh while i cook in the kitchen everything else gets grilled uh like, no crock pot all right <laughs> <laughs> this gets back to matthew's <laughs> question of we uh yep. <laughs> if there's a roast or some stew meat that gets set out to thaw I have this wonderful wife who says, oh, do you want it like this or do you want it like that? So I, I'm really not, in the, in the, for the sake of full disclosure, I should say that my wife does a lot of that cooking. Um, so the crock pot, she's the Charlie Daniels of the crock pot. Uh, so, yeah, I <laughs> can't believe I kind of took credit for that. <laughs> Matthew's keeping me honest here. but I don't know. It, it, what's your favorite way to cook? Yeah, you have any like uh, lately? I've been like just yeah, I've been doing the grill a lot, but I do like indirect heat for mm-hmm. roasts or yeah, anything just indirect. To put some wood chips over it; it's really good. Yeah, I've gotten away from staking out my back straps on anything anymore. Yeah, I cut them into about six inch chunks, and I do the slow heat yeah. thing you mentioned. And then there's this company uh, called Dog Day Spice Rubs. I just, and this, I, I had, uh, oh, oh, it was a piece of elk uh, 
uh, back strap. Might have even been a tenderloin. Uh, last fall, I had it. I found it. I, I didn't know. I thought they were all gone. I'm digging through the freezer. I'm like, jackpot. Look at this. <laughs> and so it was about a six-inch strip. And I'm slow roasting it. And I'm standing out there. I'm cutting off the pieces as they're getting done to whatever <laughs> tenderness or, or, or degree of doneness I wanted. And I'm just standing there eating that. I ate that whole thing standing there in front of the grill. I'm yes. like, I'm going to die of a hepatic coma here with this protein overload. But to your point, I, it's, it's become my preferred way. Slower is better. Uh, and I don't care if it takes three or four hours. I'll put it up on the on the rack in the back or off to the side and just let it do its thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I need to get more creative as well. I've been yeah. thinking about different ways to cook stuff. But. Yeah, I appreciate folks who can be creative in cooking. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. I'm just, I'm too Scandinavian. <laughs> you know, Minnesotans are not known for food creativity. We're like meat, potatoes, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Tater yeah. out hot dish. Yeah, that'll work. So I, I, I'm, my DNA is wired to not be a good cook. <laughs> grouse, they never make it through the freezer. There's never been a grouse that's been in my freezer, I don't think. They are put in the pot. They are on the grill or something before. I don't even know if they even get to the fridge. I guess if <laughs> I shoot more than a meal's worth, but I know. I, I get pretty excited about grouse hunting. So oh, yeah. Those of you uh, uh, who are watching the YouTube, you can see right here on this whiteboard behind me, it says grouse. We're doing a grouse episode this year. Nice. And it might be interrupted by bugling elk, but mostly we're going grouse hunting. <laughs> I'm shooting every grouse I see. I'm going to shoot them on the stump, out of trees, until my limit. I got it. And then I'm going to, whoever the cameraman is, I'm going to instruct him, you know what, I'll film you shoot every grouse till you get your limit. There you go. And I'll come home, I'll cook them, and I'll go out the next day. I, I, there, There is no grouse that I would pass up in pursuit of a bugling elk. Those elk will still be bugling. Those grouse have a tendency to just disappear. Or yeah. someone else comes along and shoots them. Yeah. Yeah. I, was just, I was just thinking you should make it interesting and do a trifecta. So you get the limit's three for mountain grouse, right? right? Yeah. So if you have, do you, you got to get one with a bow, one with a rifle, and one with a shotgun. Boy, the rifle one, I'd be in. I'm gonna have to go get a well, 22. 22, yeah. Okay, yeah. Or don't, don't you have like a how I send you some? Uh, how I sent me their little mini action 222. Oh, that yeah. would work, but boy, that thing's zinging right along. You gotta get him neck or head, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I thought you were when you said the trifecta, I thought you were gonna say rough grouse, spruce that's, grouse. <laughs> that's another one. And well, what if we, you could do both of those in the same, same plus day, an elk, that would be impressive. Yeah, plus an elk, obviously. <laughs> so, the, I think the only chance would be as dumb as a, as a spruce grouse is. I that would be my chance with a bow. Even though I've shot roughs and blues with a bow. Uh, with a twenty two, I'd probably shoot the blue grouse. It's a bigger target. Yeah. And with the shotgun, I'm gonna take the head off a of rough grouse. Yeah, rough are hard to find sometimes. They are. But. When you find them, yeah. <laughs> you've got to be relentless. You cannot give up. <laughs> they are there somewhere. They're just hiding. Yeah. So, no, I, I'm thinking we got to do a semi-live grouse hunt this fall. So, how did we get on this topic of grouse Ooh. when we we're supposed to be talking about elk? Uh, because you get sidetracked by a grouse all the time. I do. I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the semi-live bear stuff. I think we put in about like. A tenth of the grouse interactions that you had. Oh, I know. I actually made it even to the <laughs> I was, semi life content. Yeah, I was so excited about the number of grouse we saw this yeah. spring. If we get a good, good conditions for good chick crops, we're going to have a banner grouse year this year. Yeah. Now that I already have my Idaho hunting license, I bought that to apply for moose. I'm thinking I go down on the Montana Idaho border and just hop back and forth. I shoot my limit in Idaho and I shoot my limit in Montana. Nice. And that would be about two days worth of meals. Just eat grouse. nothing but grouse. Yeah. 
to survive. No, off no, yeah. <laughs> we don't need any no, no spuds, no broccoli, <laughs> none, none of this stuff. We are we're grousing it here. Yeah, it's a bold move to plan on limiting out on grouse in two states every day of the hunt. It's bold, but it's a worthy <laughs> goal to have. It's also bold to try to live off of the grouse too. I did a backpacking trip like that once where we're like, oh, we're just going to catch enough fish. We won't need to bring our own food. That, that did not work out well. Well, they say that <laughs> the, the hungry wolf hunts the hardest. So maybe if I got hungry enough, I'd uh, hunt a little harder. Mm-hmm. But. All right. So back on track. Here. All right. Back back to elk. I'm um, sorry. I'm so, sorry. I was just thinking, I don't even know if we answered the other part of that question. Was <laughs> it about, like, dehydrating food or something? Oh, yeah. no, I don't do any dehydrating. I used to. I don't anymore. Yeah. But. Um, so it's your last hunt. What species, what hunt would it be, uh, where, and why? <sighs> I saw that question on there, so I've been thinking about it for a while. It would be... I, okay, so there, there's answer A and 1A and 1B. Can we do that? Sure. So can do whatever you want. One A would I wouldn't even have the tag. You would have the tag, mm-hmm. and we'd go and do some of the things we've done that have been fun before, and I wouldn't even care. It, it could be elk, it could be deer, it could be I I don't care, but I think what the person meant is all right, Randy. They've told you this is your last hunt. Where are you going? What are you hunting for? And how are you doing it? And I'm going to say, hand me my bow, and I'm hoping that I'm a little bit older than I am right now when this last hunt is facing me. I like, at least give me another eight or ten years. So, uh, but I'm probably going after bugling elk, and I don't care where. Uh, it, I'm a bit sentimental to some of the places where I've chased elk for decades south of my house here. Um, so if it was just this sentimental last hunt, you're probably going to see me, uh, south of Bozeman with a bow in my hand, uh, hoping that a grizzly bear terminates my existence instead of a nursing home. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. What would yours be, Matthew? You, you guys are both, you guys are both 27. So th- these kind of thoughts don't even enter your mind yet, or it didn't when I was 27. You, you want me to go? go Both for it. Each of you get a crack at this one. Uh, well, I mean, if it was my last time, am I still in shape in this hypothetical scenario? <laughs> I don't know. They didn't say that. You, you, get, you get to create the all remainder right. of the this, hypothetical right. situation. If I'm, still, if I'm still in shape, I'd, I'd go after doll sheep. I think that would be pretty pretty awesome. You'd I don't, t- I don't know where, if it would be Northwest Territories or Alaska or what. But you'd tell Kara, you know what? You're going to have a little less money to live on. <laughs> that would be I'm the problem, to. though, is it is not cheap. <laughs> but, no, but just I, because of the cool places. I mean, they live in pretty crazy, yeah. pretty crazy places. Yeah. Matthew? I, uh, I, you'd probably go duck hunting if I know you. But. No. Probably go elk hunting. <laughs> um, you, no one ever gets to see this in the episodes, but I usually wind up wandering around taking photos of stuff. Right. Um, All the, time. the scenery. Uh, probably more than actually hunting when we're on hunts. Um, so I'd probably go somewhere where I could do that and probably be a rifle elk hunt, I yeah. would say, uh, just because you're usually up in the mountains. You get to have some nice scenery a lot of times, and it's well, probably where I'd be. The one hunt where I thought you were going to wear out a camera taking pictures was in Arizona. Well, we were right um, off the Grand Canyon. It was a... Uh, you know, snowing, snowing. The Grand Canyon was fogged in. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, didn't see much in the way of elk for several days. So I was entertaining myself <laughs> with taking photos of cactus yeah. with snow on them. Yeah. yeah. No, if if health, well, going back to your hypothetical, Marcus, if health had waned to the point where I couldn't get up the mountain for an elk hunt, it's a slam dunk no brainer for me. I'm going to Wyoming pronghorn hunting. I thought that was going to be your answer anyway, it, to be well, honest. It, it's <laughs> always, it, for me, it, 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 when people ask that question, I always, if they're there, I always say, are we talking rifle or archery? Yeah. Because there's nothing I'd rather uh, archery hunt than elk. But 
there is just something about chasing pronghorn in places like Wyoming or Nevada or New Mexico that you give me a rifle in October, late September, and turn me loose on the pronghorn, and you are not going to find a guy in America with a bigger smile than I have. And then when you shoot one, the the work is way easier than when you got an <laughs> elk down. And I would rather eat pronghorn than elk. I, I mean, that's, that's not a knock against pro, uh, elk. That's just a statement of how good pronghorn is. I just wish they were bigger. Because <laughs> I hate getting only one cooler full of meat off an animal that tastes that good. Yeah, and then they're generally in places where it's a lot easier to pack them out, too. Way right? easier. If elk could be the size of antelope and antelope could be the size of elk, that would be very convenient. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we didn't go our normal two-hour stretch here, but we wanted to plow through a bunch of these questions that uh, we had. Uh, and so if, if you've been following the Elk Talk Live series, thanks so much for, for being there. We're only, we've only done two of them, uh, and uh, we sure hope that uh, – you'll tune in to do a lot more. And for those of you who have tuned in and we haven't got to your question, hopefully some of these questions we covered today uh, help with that. Um, And summer is upon us. Now it's just trying not to get fat and out of shape uh, (laughs) while I'm out walleye fishing, trying to stay married. So that's the other thing. The audience doesn't know that if I don't walleye fish a couple days a week with my wife, this whole thing is going to implode because she is that serious about walleye fishing. So uh, you don't get a lot of exercise walleye fishing. So I'm trying to balance that. Um, but we got a busy calendar. Could make you just row the boat instead of using the boat. Yeah, I can, yeah. See, I can see. <laughs> you get a paddle we, boat. Yeah. We could yeah. find ways to make it. Yeah. No. We could. Let's not go there, though. I'm getting too old. But And then I, I, for those of you on watching the YouTube version, you, you can't see this on the podcast version, but here's what the whiteboard looks like this year. So I'll just run through this real quick. Uh, we need five to seven elk tags in a season. We need two to three antelope tags in a season, uh, two to three deer tags in a season, and one quote-unquote other. Um, and our cup has runneth over this year. And we're still waiting for Marcus to draw his Montana mountain goat tag this year. Oh, I'm sure he's and got really good odds for ne- that. So. Next week, we find out. Yeah. All three of us are in the drawing for moose, goat, and sheep in Montana. But looking at this, we I've got Montana elk, which I'm doing. Well, I say I'm doing archery elk in Montana. It's really grouse hunting in Montana with a bow in my hand in case an elk bugles. Then you and I have Wyoming elk. And then I've got Arizona elk. Jerry's got Arizona elk. So just that is five elk hunts that's going to get us through. Uh, Pronghorn, uh, I haven't put an orange mark by this because I'm not sure if I'm going to draw Wyoming. I hope so. Mm. Our buddy Jim from uh, Thorn Bay, Alaska, I'm sure he's going to draw. He's got tons of points. Uh, We're taking the Onyx Maps person, uh, their sweepstakes winner, taking them to New Mexico. Uh, deer, I've got my Montana. We're taking Cushman, uh, here in Montana. I drew Nevada archery mule deer. Uh, Wade and I, unless something changes with points, we should be hunting the Kaibab this year in Arizona. And then in early August, we're going, uh, blacktail hunting again up in Alaska, uh, flying into Thorn Bay, meeting up with my buddy Jim. And so Jim will have a tag. I'll have a tag and Tyler will have a tag. And then we got Montana bear every year, but we all we also have Alaska bear next spring. We got grouse, and then we've got Mike Spitzer drew that sheep tag in Nevada. So uh, I don't know where we're going to fit our moose, goat, and sheep hunts on this calendar, but <laughs> yeah, they're just going to have to be weekend <clears throat> weekend warrior yeah. hunts or something. <laughs> so that's what our whiteboard looks like, and some of this is uh, playing to the audience that is watching on YouTube. Um, and for those of you on the podcast, uh, I give you that list just to give you an idea of how our our schedule <laughs> gets complicated. You look at all those trips, all those places we have to be 
from August 1st to about December 10th. Yeah, and not only is it the five or six or whatever days hunting, you got travel, travel days, days on either end. Yeah. And everybody tries to get home for a day or two each month. <laughs> uh, the last thing I can have is for Marcus to end up getting thrown out in the street by his wife. Uh, I, I don't want to get thrown out in the street by my wife either, but the odds are that if I was to hang around here too much, she'd say, don't you have something to do? Get out of my hair. Get out from underfoot. But anyhow, folks, we sure appreciate you listening. Uh, some of these podcasts we're going to be doing going forward here are going to be informational. Uh, we're trying to make them fun. Uh, if you've got thoughts or ideas, uh, content, topics, we have a thread out on our Hunt Talk forum where we're asking people, what do you want us to talk about on the podcast? Uh, we did that video a couple of weeks ago about bear spray and how to kind of hunt elk in grizzly country. That's out on our YouTube channel. And as a result of that, we ended up, I had breakfast the other day with a guy I know here in town who's been attacked by a grizzly bear. And he said, yeah, as quick as I get a break in my schedule, I'd love to get on your podcast and let's talk elk hunting and talk all kinds of cool stuff. And yeah, if you want to talk about getting eaten by a grizzly bear, I'll tell my story. Um, so I'm pretty sure that one will, will be very interesting for people to hear because uh, a lot of people get a hold of us uh, and say, oh, I'm, I don't want to hunt in grizzly country. And I get that. Yeah, I think all of us... We live here, we just accept it as, oh, well, you know, is what it is. I mean, the other night, bear hunting, black bear hunting, I that was so far away. I'm still not 100% sure it was a sow and two cubs or if it was a, a blonde phase uh, sow black bear. But with the big hump on its shoulder, I'm, I'm going with it was a grizzly bear. Yeah, I think it very likely. Yeah. And it was just either that it was the biggest sow black bear I've ever seen. Uh, but it was what was it? It was a mile away. Probably. It was a ways, yeah. So, but I think we just kind of said, well, that's just part of the landscape here. If you're gonna be afraid of grizzly bears, you're gonna have to take up golf or something. And I'm not doing that. So, anyhow, we got a bunch of cool stuff uh, on the slate for uh, podcast topics coming up. So. Anyhow, folks, we uh, we laid off the politics here. Uh, doesn't mean that we're giving the politicians any uh, break or, or giving them a free ride, but uh, you guys get to hear enough of that uh, every once in a while. We want to just have a campfire chat. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take care.